Welcome to The Real News Network and our continuing coverage of the inauguration of President Barack Obama. Joining us now is Dr. and Professor James Galbraith, a noted economist whose book, The Predator State, is one of the Bibles of understanding today's economics. Thanks for joining us, James. My pleasure. So uh, we started off uh, a month or two ago, just near the end of the election. The sky was falling. Capitalism, as we know, it's about to end. We need this massive bailout. Tremendous uh, urgency in the air. Now, President Obama has, has come, and uh, the future is looking brighter. The stimulus package is going to work. There's almost a kind of sense in the media, at least, that the stimulus package will hit and everything will be more or less okay. So where, what's, in your opinion, where are we at? How serious is this moment, and will this package really address it? Hope is a good thing, but it can also be a little bit dangerous. The sky has not gone back to its normal place, and it isn't going back there. Uh, the stimulus package, the expansion bill, I think is a good bill. It should be enacted quickly, but no one should kid themselves. This is only the start of the process. This is a very fundamental, very deep economic crisis. It's outside the range of our living experience, uh, and it's going to be with us for a long time. So it's going to be, in fact, the defining issue of this administration. It's not going to be something that a single bill is going to put right and then put him into the position to get back to a kind of normal legislative and reform process, which many people would like, but they're, they're going to be disappointed. Now, there seems to be two pillars to this crisis, as I understand it, and, and tell me what you think. Uh, one is there's this financial crisis, which is the, the uh, paralyzing of the banks. Uh, nobody seems to know what anything is worth anymore with the pop of the subprime mortgage uh, crisis. Nobody really knows what real estate values are anymore. So nobody wants to loan money and we have this paralysis. But, uh, but there's also this issue of purchasing power, which is the extent to which uh, people have been borrowing money to maintain their standard of living. Mm -hmm. So talk about what you think is the underlying issue here and, and how should it be addressed? Well, credit is purchasing power. So I tend to lean to the view that this is fundamentally a crisis that originates in the financial system. It came about because of the deregulation of um, banks in general, but particularly of mortgage originations, the creation of this huge subprime market of uh, basically abusive mortgages, uh, the marketing of the instruments based on those mortgages to the investment community, created a kind of Gordian knot of, as you said, instruments that cannot be valued, banks that no longer knew which each, what each other were worth, what they themselves were worth, became unwilling to, to, to lend to each other, to anybody else. Asset values have crashed. We are now in a full-fledged debt def deflation, the first since the early 1930s, and that is a, is a very deep structural problem. Cannot be repaired without reorganizing, recapitalizing, uh, re-regulating the financial system and giving it entirely new leadership. So this is going to be a major task. In the meantime, there is the, how the question of how you maintain purchasing power, how you keep up the level of activity in the economy, uh, and basically the only channels that are available to you are public channels. So we've got to uh, We've got to spend, we've got to build the infrastructure, but more immediately and perhaps on a larger scale, I would increase Social Security benefits, restore the incomes that have been lost by the elderly population on average. I would cut payroll taxes and restore the incomes of the working population to a certain degree. And do as much of that as you need to do in order to keep all of the, um, not only the sky, but all of the walls and the ceiling and everything else from falling in, which they are, in it is in fact doing and basically everywhere you look in the economy. Well, in those two specific suggestions, do you see a response to that in the Obama plans? Uh, not yet. I mean, there is, there is some tax relief. It could be substantially larger. On Social Security, what we're hearing is that this is a, a long-term issue where they were actually thinking about cutting back. And to me, that would be um, disastrous because what is actually happening uh, in the economy of the elderly is that the, the parts of their incomes which are not based on, on, on the public system, on Social Security, the parts that were based on private savings, on stock market investment, that has crumbled. People have lost half or more well, if, so if, far. If certainly one of the issues here is purchasing power, and, and, and certainly purchasing power, if your purchasing power is high enough, you don't have to borrow as much money. So even the credit part certainly has a relationship to the lack of real purchasing power by working people. Um, but if you look at the auto bailout, they want to lower auto workers' wages. 
Uh, if, there was a meeting apparently recently. Obama met with uh, some of the conservative columnists, David Brooks and Krauthammer and George Will and William Crystal. And Brooks was on television a few days ago, and he says, "I'm very." He, he said, "I'm very encouraged by what I heard from Obama. It looks like after throwing all kinds of money." of stimulus at the economy, which may mean kind of printing it or borrowing it, he's going to make up for it by taking on the entitlement programs in two years, which means to actually do the opposite of what you're saying in terms of putting purchasing power into people's hands. Well, if David Brooks is encouraged, then I'm discouraged, except for the fact that I don't really trust David Brooks's uh, judgment and insight on these matters. So I think circumstances are going to rule and here, and I do think that they, th there's a vast public demand for effective action. And when it becomes clear, and people have, have to be given some time to learn what the situation is, but when it becomes clear that the first round of action wasn't enough, uh, then my hope is that we will get further rounds uh, that will begin to match up to the scale of the challenge. Uh, and I really think, of course, they've made considerable progress in just coming as far as they have in setting the principle that we need to have greatly expanded public spending and in funding all of the initiatives that are in the present bill. It's a good bill. It's probably the best thing that can be enacted in the two-week time frame that they're, that they're planning for, for action because it basically relies on putting money out through previously authorized channels. But it isn't going to be the final word and the real question now is how do you go uh, and make it clear to people that expectations should not be too high, uh, we should not be expecting a quick return to normality, and that we're going to have to have substantial further action in the months ahead. And, and if the problem on the finance side is still that banks don't want to lend, even after all this bailout money, and you hear quotes from uh, presidents of banks saying, well, we're not changing our business model just because we got some public money. Mm -hmm. Of course, their business model is part of what gave us the crisis. Two, they're using the money to pay themselves dividends and take care of their shareholders, which I guess is respecting their business model, mm -hmm. and they still don't want to lend. Th sh should, do you think that uh, Obama should, President Obama should go the next step and consider taking, really taking over one of these institutions and making it a kind of more of a public utility and, and having some way to directly get, break this logjam? This would not be the first bank taken over in this crisis. IndyMac in California has already been nationalized and is being put to public purposes. When a bank is insolvent, uh, the model that we have, the functioning model, is that the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation uses its bridge bank facility to take it over. So it's really a question of coming to a realistic judgment of what is the state of Citigroup, what is the state of Bank of America, are they in fact insolvent, could they be, are, are they likely to be able to survive on their own. And if not, then the government has responsibilities which it knows how to exercise. And yes, once that happens, then the bank becomes uh, essentially subject to public policy direction. But aren't we there? I mean, there's yes, after $700 billion dollars in this yes. kind of crisis. Yes, I think we're there. What, what, are we, what are we waiting for? Sheila Baer needs to make that determination, but yes, I think in practice, my view is that we are there or we will be so there. So essentially, you nationalize one of these big banks, you say now it's a public utility and we're going to start loaning money. Well, you can change the terms of mortgages, and what you're going to do there is to then, and you're going to give a lot of households, those who still have equity in their homes and are eligible for refinancing, you will help their purchasing power. Uh, for those who don't have the equity, you're going to have to think about how to restructure their existing mortgages. Um, I think the problem, though, goes beyond the willingness of banks to lend. There is the question of whether businesses want to borrow and whether borrowers, uh, households, have collateral that will support new borrowing, which the, given the state of home prices, they don't. So my view is whatever happens in the financial sector, it will not be the major driver of, of eventual recovery. And we shouldn't be looking as, at the problem as though this is one which fixing the financial sector as such will fix. We are going to have to come in directly to support the activity level of the economy. And that's households, uh, that's, uh, that's, I say, retirees, that is state and local governments in a very big way, and that's industrial corporations. And that means that you really have to, you know, have, to have a reserve set of institutions that are public, uh, that are capable of acting quickly, but also planning for the long term. And those, that second group is going to have to be created. So as I say, this is not a problem which is going to go away and not a situation which is going to return to normal in two years. In the next segment of our interview, I'm going to ask you to tell, tell us what is your litmus test mm -hmm. to tell us whether the Obama presidency is going to be a successful one 
or a failure. Please join us for the second part of our interview with James Galbraith.